Hey everybody and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. Tonight we're looking at Psalm 23. You may have noticed that as we've been going through Psalms on Wednesday evenings, I've, it looks like I'm just kind of randomly going through the Psalms and that's sort of true. When I decided to do this, what I started doing is I just started at Psalm 1 and just kind of started prayerfully going through the Psalms and just camping out where one grabbed my attention, where I thought maybe this was something that our church needed to hear right now and that would be appropriate for us. And so last week I was at Psalm 22, and this week I opened to Psalm 23, and I said, you know what, let's just, let's just do Psalm 23. It's one of the most familiar psalms, if not the most familiar psalm. In fact, it's one of the most familiar passages of Scripture. In fact, the, the truth is even non-Christians are frequently familiar with at least some of the words. In fact, it's found its way into pop culture a lot. There are songs uh, that quote the 23rd Psalm, if not in its entirety, at least in part, by b people like Kanye West and YouTube, and, or YouTube, not YouTube, YouTube, The Grateful Dead, uh, Pink Floyd, and it's appeared in movies such as Rooster Cogburn, Pale Rider, Titanic, and so it's all throughout culture that people have been quoting at least some of the words. And, you know, I can tell you that even as a non-Christian, I was familiar with the words, the Lord is my shepherd. I was familiar with the words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Now, I didn't really know what any of those meant or hadn't really given much thought to them, but they were very familiar. And, and so I think a lot of times these most familiar passages of Scripture, even for us Christians, can be the ones that we are the least familiar with in terms of meaning. We hear them so much that I'm afraid sometimes we don't even really stop to think about them. So what we're going to do tonight is we're not going to, to spend a, a long, in-depth time, but I do want us to look at Psalm 23, and I would just encourage you to take it maybe in your quiet time one day this week and pray through it and just think about it, meditate on the words, but we'll take a look at it, just uh, a, an overview tonight, and uh, then we'll have some prayer time when we get done. So let's Take a look at the 23rd Psalm. It says, uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever." Now, the first thing we see in these first three verses is we see God as the guide. Now, obviously, here's a, a shepherd motif here, a shepherd theme going throughout here. But we see God as the guide. These verses indicate His leadership and its guidance, the kind of leadership and guidance that a shepherd would give to his sheep. The, the good shepherd leads his sheep in such a way that they have no lack. I shall not want, he says. And for the sheep who follow the shepherd, there is good. He talks about green pastures and still waters. Aren't these nice images? It gives the idea of a calm respite, of refreshing the soul. He talks about restoring the soul. I mean, can't you imagine? Can't you imagine just being somewhere where there's this beautiful green mountain lake and the waters are still and you just get to sit there by the lake and bask in the warm sunlight. Doesn't that sound great? Doesn't that sound like that would refresh your soul? That would certainly be some great therapy for me just to be able to go up to some mountain lake like that and hang out in a green pasture. Now, it sounds really good, but it doesn't mean there's no trouble for God's people. Leading beside the still waters and in the green pastures doesn't mean no trouble. We know that from reading Scripture. I mean, Jesus said in John 16, 33, that in this world we would have tribulation. I mean, there's a lot of trouble in the world. We know that. In fact, we're going to get to trouble later when He's in the valley of the shadow of death. But what it means is that there's a calm within the souls of those who are following the Good Shepherd. It doesn't mean there's a calm on the outside of us necessarily, but there's a calm within the souls. In fact, can I just tell you one of the best indications for me that my 
walk with Jesus isn't right is there's an uneasiness in my soul. I start getting unsettled. I start getting tense. I start getting edgy and I'm, I'm stressed out. And as soon as I see those things in my life, I know that what I, what's wrong is that I'm not spending ample time with the Lord. And it's not just clock time. It's good time. In fact, we probably should maybe use the term quiet time a little less than quality time where we need to really have that time where we focus on God's Word and offer our prayers to Him. And it's amazing what just walking with Him can do for our souls. And so he says that uh, that's why it says that He leads in paths of righteousness. So where God leads is always good. It's always righteous. And do you know you're never at peace when you're going your own way, are you? You know, when you decide you're going to reject God's plan for your life, when you decide you're going to go against God's Word, there's no peace in that. There's always the feelings of guilt. There's always the feelings of shame. There's the conscience. Not only that, think about the trouble that I've brought to my own life for the times that I have decided to go my own way instead of following in the paths of righteousness for His namesake. The truth is that following Jesus restores the soul. And I would just ask you tonight, is your soul refreshed? Are you feeling restored? I'm not asking if there's problems going on. I'm not asking if you're, you're, you've got a lot happening in your life right now. But how about your soul? Are you tending to your soul? Are you, are you nourishing your soul? And the way to do that is getting alone with the Lord. So make sure that you're doing that. So we see God as guide. Then we see God as protector in verse 4. He says, even though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. He talks about this dark valley, literally the valley of deep darkness. So I had you picture in your mind being at that mountain lake, the sun on you. But now imagine that you're in the mountains and you're down in a dark valley and it's one of those moonless nights and you can't see anything and you're stuck in that valley and you're hearing animals all around you. Or maybe there's some, some criminals out there or something or some people that you're unsure about and you're hearing all kinds of sounds in the woods and you can't see anything and you're stuck down in this valley of deep darkness. But you don't fear any evil. Why? Because God's with you. In fact, it's really interesting in the original language when it says, for you are with me. That's not just the normal word for with me. That's a word that's connected to the verb to stand. And it's got this idea. It's, it's an emphatic type of preposition. So it's not like God's just in, uh, hanging around. It's not like God's just there. It's like God is there. God is present. God is standing firm with you. And it means it's something really important. In fact, when we look at this, what does it say that the shepherd carries? He carries a rod and a staff. Have you ever thought about the rod and the staff? Do you even know about those? You're probably used to thinking of a shepherd's crook, that staff that the shepherd uh, carries with him. And of course, in the Christmas plays and all that, you always see a little kid with the shepherd with his little shepherd's crook and all that. Well, and that is something that the shepherds would carry. And that was their staff. And sometimes it would have that crook on the end, but sometimes it would just be straight. But the staff is what he would use. I mean, that's what he would lean against, you know, when he's standing out in the, in the pastures. But he would use that just sort of gently tapping and guiding the sheep. And, and so this is what he's reaching out, giving the sheep direction with. And so the idea here is that, that God has his staff. And with that staff, he's nudging us to keep going the way we're going. But have you ever thought about the rod? You see, these, these shepherds would grow up to be shepherds and they would start even as boys. And early on, they would take a sapling and they would start fashioning their own rod from it. And so the staff's this long thing, but the rod is, is going to be something shorter. And the rod isn't something that the shepherd used gently guiding. The rod is something that he used as a weapon. Something we don't think about when we're thinking about God as the shepherd. What's one of the jobs of the shepherd? One of the jobs as a shepherd is to kill the wolves, right? To keep the wolves away. In fact, do you remember when David was about to go take on Goliath? And he's talking to King Saul and, and they're like, you know, how, how are you going to just go out there against him without all the armor on? And you remember what David the shepherd said? 
He talks about how there would be times when he was tending his sheep and a bear would come and take off one of his sheep or a, a lion would come and take off with one of his sheep. And you know what he said he would do? He would chase the animal down and snatch his sheep back and take his sheep back to safety. That's, that's also the image. We get an image of a shepherd of being gentle and caring, but the shepherd is not gentle and caring with the enemies of his people. He's a mighty warrior, really, on their behalf. But, you know, he also used that rod with the sheep from time to time. You know, I talked about how the staff would, um, would uh, kind of gently correct the sheep and keep them in line. But I was actually reading an account of a, of a shepherd in the Middle East. And he said one of the things they would do with the rod is if a sheep, like, got away and started running away, these shepherds would be quite expert with their rods and they would take these heavy rods and they would throw them at the sheep and it would thunk on the sheep and the sheep would be startled and would run back to get with the rest of the flock. And so God uses that rod to protect and to correct and it's good and it's comforting that He's there giving that guidance and that protection. It's the rod and the staff that give us Comfort, He always leads in the best places. And even in the darkness, He's there to protect us. But we also see God as host. This is where it sort of leaves the shepherd idea in verses 5 and 6 where He says, uh, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And um, many see this connected to 2 Samuel chapter 17. And 2 Samuel 17, David is actually fleeing from Absalom. And his, David and his men are just worn ragged. And Absalom gets counsel from two different guys. And he chooses the counsel that actually allows David time to cross the Jordan. And we read in 2 Samuel 17 that God ordained for Absalom to take that one person's counsel. So David crosses the Jordan and he finds himself in the territory of the Ammonites and the Gileadites. So here he is, he's got Absalom pursuing him, wanting to kill him on the one hand, and he winds up in these foreign territories on the other. And what do we read that happens there? What happens when he is in the presence of his enemies? The Ammonites and the Gileadites, it says, bring David and his army beds, basins, and earthen vessels, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, and lentils, honey, and curds, and sheep, and cheese from the herd for David and the people with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Here's David with his enemies hot on his heel in the presence of enemy territory. And what does God do? God spreads a table before him in the presence of his enemies. In fact, one of the things a host does is anoint the head with oil and fill the cup. And David just is describing the way God fills the cup as the cup is just brimming. It's overflowing because God's provision is so great. And the goodness and mercy of God follow David. They pursue David in this life and into the next. Isn't this interesting, this language? Here he is being pursued by Absalom, but who else is pursuing David? God is. God's pursuing him. His enemies aren't the only ones pursuing him. God's pursuing him as well, and his enemies can't outrun. And you know what? You can't outrun God either. When I was reading this and thinking about this, I, I uh, thought of the old poem. It was written around the turn of the last century, around 1900, by Francis Thompson called The Hound of Heaven. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but you should Google it. It's a really, really long poem, and uh, it's got some of that older language. It's kind of hard to read, but I want to read you just the first several lines of that because The Hound of Heaven is the is the one pursuing the rebellious sinner who's running from God. Listen to these words. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him and under running laughter. Up vistaed hopes I sped and shot precipitated down titanic glooms of chasmed fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat. And a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. 
goes on to talk about how God finally chased him down. And that's the way God pursues his sheep. That's the way God follows after us. If you believe you're being overtaken by whatever enemies in your life, whatever circumstances, or if you believe you've outrun God to the point that you're outside His reach, surely His goodness and His mercy will follow you all the days of your life and into the next life. And surely you will dwell with Him forever. I should note, however, that uh, the Lord is not everyone's shepherd. These are for the, His sheep. Jesus talks about those who are goats, those who aren't of His sheepfold, and He talks about His sheep, those that belong to Him. And I would just say to you, if you know that God's pursuing you right now, would you just go ahead and surrender to Him? Um, don't wait for Him to whack you in the head with His rod as you're running away from Him. Or maybe He's been whacking you in the head with His rod. Why don't you just go ahead and surrender and find the life, find that green pasture, find those still waters, find the comfort in the darkest of the valleys, find that table spread out before you in the presence of your enemies. Go ahead and, and surrender to Him because He has pursued you all the way to the cross. He's pursued you all the way to the cross and even the grave was not powerful enough to hold Him, so turn to Him and He will be your shepherd, He will be your guide, He will be your protector and He will lay before you a feast in this life, and a feast unending in the next. Won't you turn to the Lord that He would be your shepherd as well? Psalm 23 is great, isn't it? It's a beautiful, beautiful passage of assurance for those who belong to Him. Well, let's spend a few minutes in prayer with the time that we have. And um, as always, if you have prayer requests, you can send them in. And I did get... Uh, some prayer requests, and we have a few here, and we want to pray for a couple of our church members who are in uh, the hospital, uh, Marlena and Sherry, both in the hospital. Also, Billy Schaefer, a longtime church member, uh, died yesterday, and so we want to be praying for Billy's family. She was a sweet, sweet lady, and so please be praying for them. Uh, we want to pray for Jamie Stewart, who's had to have a heart cath. And for Jill Vasquez, who's the daughter of the Thigpens, John and Thig Peggy Thigpen, who's been diagnosed with cancer. So we want to pray for her. Um, also, we want to pray for um, some folks who've had surgery and a couple of people who need surgery um, but aren't getting it. I'll, I'll voice those in a minute. Some folks going through cancer treatments. And, um, and I got a prayer request today for a little boy named Tripp who's five years old and he's got some sort of uh, problem with his eyes and he needs eye surgery. But right now it's not considered life-threatening or essential. So it's been postponed. And so the family has asked that we pray for little Tripp's eyes. So would you join me as we pray for him? And then we'll pray for the rest of the things that we have been making a habit of praying about when it comes to the virus and the things we're going through right now. So let's pray together. Father, it is so good to be able to come to You, uh, our shepherd, and take all our concerns to You, all our fears, all our worries, and just give them over to You so that You can carry these burdens that we don't have to be burdened with them. And we want to pray tonight for Billy's family that... Uh, They've lost mom and grandma right now and lost dad a while back. And so we pray that um, you would comfort them, that they would find truly that you are the good shepherd that gets them through the dark valleys, the valley of the shadow of death. We pray for um, Marlena and Sherry as they're both in the hospital for complete recovery, that they would be able to go home. We pray for Jamie following this heart cath that he would be in good shape. For Jill, who's been diagnosed with cancer, we pray for complete healing of Jill's body. Father, we pray for Gail and Mary as they're both recovering from surgery. For Sharnice and Daisy as they are both waiting for surgeries that are not considered essential surgeries or necessary. Um, and for John and Jonathan who are undergoing cancer treatments, we pray for those treatments to work. We pray that you would keep their spirits up, keep uh, their families positive and hopeful as they look to you. 
And we pray for little Trip who needs this eye surgery. And Lord, we pray that you would restore whatever is going on with his eyes, that you would heal his eyes. Please take care of little Trip. Help his parents not to be anxious, but to rest in you. Father, we want to pray for our leaders who uh, just are carrying such weight, trying to balance the economy and people's health and making all of these kinds of decisions. And it's, I know sometimes we look at that and think that those decisions are easy, but that's because we don't have to make them. And so we pray for them to have wisdom and resolve as they, as they go through those things and help them to make the, the best decisions. And um, we want to pray for all the frontliners out there who are dealing with the public and working with sick people. And Father, we would even throw in the service industry people into the frontliners as, as they're out there trying to get our goods and services to us um, on a daily basis. And we pray for their protection and for their stamina, for their health. We want to continue praying for researchers who are trying to find vaccines and cures. And Lord, we pray that that would happen. We pray that you would um, give them the wisdom and the uh, knowledge that they need to, to come up with whatever it takes to get rid of this disease. And we pray for those who are suffering under this disease for their families who can't be with them. We pray for those who have lost loved ones in this disease. And Lord, we're praying for your comfort. We're praying for people to turn to you, to know you, to find their only true hope and their only true comfort in this life and in the next. And Lord, we, we, want, to, uh, we want to thank you for a great resurrection celebration. Thank you for what happened on Sunday. We're so thankful that so many people were able to hear the good news of the resurrected Lord. We're thankful that so many people got to be here in their cars and just wave at one another and, and just be back at the church even though we weren't inside the church. And Lord, it was, it was refreshing to our souls to be able to participate in that. We're thankful for the technology and the people that know how to work the technology to, to make all that happen. We're thankful for these cameras right now and for the ability that we have to stream this so that we can stay in touch with one another. God, I'm so thankful that everybody at Central has just been so supportive and so gracious and so positive, and I pray that we would stay that way. And, and I pray that we don't miss whatever it is that you're doing right now. We believe you're always at work, that you're always at work for your glory, that your glory is always for our good. We believe that your plans are always best. So just help us to be obedient to you. Help us to, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us not to get wrapped up in the things the world's wrapped up in with anger and blame and fear and worry. But help us to look for what you're doing, that we might be involved in your work. Help us not to miss the opportunities that you're putting before us right now to touch lives and to advance your kingdom. And Father, I pray that we would be a people who walk with restored and refreshed souls. That even in the midst of a pandemic, our souls can be beside the still waters. Our souls can lie down in green pastures. That even when our souls are in the dark valleys, that there's no fear. For the shepherd is with us with his rod and his staff. Oh God, help us to take great comfort in that. So we thank you for hearing our prayers tonight. Thank you for loving us the way you do. You're so good to us. Oh God, you're so, so good to us. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy that pursue us through this life and into the next. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us tonight. I hope you're having a great week and please, please, let us hear from you if there's anything at all we can do for you. Y'all have a good night.